Uh, Mr Speaker, it is a great honour to be standing here before you as the member for Vaucluse, only the tenth person to do so in almost 100 years since the formation of our electorate in 1927. I'd like to thank our community for entrusting me with this great responsibility. And I pledge to always remember that this role isn't mine, it is yours. This community is not mine, it is ours. And well before we occupied this stunning headline, it was and it is theirs. The Gadigal, Bidjigal and Birribirigal people have lived across the eastern part of Sydney for millennia. I acknowledge our Indigenous history um, and culture will promote ongoing friendship and respect and honour their intrinsic link to land and waterways by pledging to protect our natural environment for future generations. Vaucluse is just 24 square kilometres, one of the smallest electorates in the state and one of the most densely populated. Behind the sparkling harbourside fringe that we're so often stereotyped by lies a community that I love for so many other riches, uh, for a diversity of cultures, of enterprise and of ideas. Half of those living in our electorate are first generation Australians with both parents born overseas and many more come from other parts of Australia and from Sydney. We choose to live in a place marked by contrasts. You'll see barefoot surfers in budgie smugglers at Bondi, crisply uniformed officers at HMAS Watson, Jewish families heading to synagogue, people dropping a fishing line at the historic village of Watson's Bay, fast cars moving very slowly through Australia's version of <laughs> Rodeo Drive in Double Bay, parents and babies and dogs at Seven Ways in North Bondi, and you will see high rise after high rise because two thirds of our electorate is made up of flats and apartments and a further 20% in semis, so we're packed in. I love the rich tapestry that makes up our busy and our diverse community. And my challenge as local MP is to represent everyone equitably. Whether you are young or old, whether you're born or raised locally, or whether, like the majority in our electorate, have come from somewhere else and chosen our amazing electorate as home. So I'm one of those people. I grew up in regional South Australia. I'm a country girl at heart. First in the west coast tuna fishing town of Port Lincoln, uh, and then in wine country in the Barossa Valley, north of Adelaide. Dad ran a small business and mum worked in the local school. My sister, um, Juliet, and my brother Adam and I were taught that we could achieve, achieve anything through hard work, persistence, and most importantly, honesty. Service was part of our upbringing. Mum and Dad were always parts of clubs like Apex and Rotary, sports and arts and local health committees. Dad recently retired as mayor. My parents have always put family and community ahead of any personal ambition. And I like to think, I really like to think that those values have shaped who I am today. Um, and it's taken me on this pathway here, also to community representation. I'm proudly public school educated, went to Newry High, hello everyone in the Barossa, before juggling university and a cadetship at the ABC where I began my career as a journalist. My first ever interview, um, it was in my birthday week, I'd just turned 18, was with the Premier. Um, straight in the deep end, but that's how I like it. I was drawn to political reporting, so I sat up there. Um, I loved that contest of ideas. I moved to Sydney in 1997 to join the Nine Network, where I would spend 14 years with a front row seat to history, hosting major network shows and covering breaking news at home and abroad. I interviewed prime ministers, plenty of movie stars, business leaders and sporting heroes. I got to see inside submarines and fly in Black Hawk helicopters. I covered the Oscars. I danced with John Travolta on his private jet. <laughs> Adam's so sick of that story. <laughs> and I'll bet not too many people say that in their inaugural speech. I had a lot of fun. It was a great privilege. But it was the events that impacted everyday people that really shaped me as a person. And it was a privilege to be able to give a voice to the quiet Australians. Um, to the people who were doing it tough or people who'd been silenced. People who felt that politicians in this place or in Canberra did not have their best interests at heart. Behaved poorly. You wouldn't do that, would you? <laughs> Talked more about themselves and not about their communities and not in the public interest. Um, I promise you, all those people I interviewed, I have taken note. 
Journalism, journalism immersed me in so many different worlds, and I shared many life-changing moments with people. I've been with families when they lost their homes to floods. I've been at fire fronts. I have seen the flames and witnessed the sheer terror of that destructive force. I've seen the indescribable relief and also simultaneous guilt that families felt. I was with them when their neighbour's house burned to the ground and inexplicably their home was spared. I witnessed the trauma in the aftermath of the Bali bombings when I covered the tragedy in Kuta that took the lives of 202 people, including 88 Australians, and 20 of those were from the eastern suburbs. I remember the shock we felt as a nation, the disbelief, and I remember the heroism of, of the doctors, of the holiday makers, and of the Balinese who came together in that time achieving extraordinary acts of humanity. I still feel the pain of those families and survivors today and I remember them more than 20 years on. It is impossible not to be changed by that experience and it's, it's given me goosebumps even talking about it today. Something that binds us all in all of our experiences, the only thing that saves us from disaster, from loneliness, from grief, from struggle, is family and community. The strength of community comes from so many hands joined together a powerful cohesion, a sense of common purpose and a sense of belonging. It is the job of governments to support communities, ensure that we create policies that bring people together and not divide them. Give them individual autonomy within a supportive network. That is how society thrives. I've seen that up, so up close and personal as a journalist and that was a privilege. And while that was really important work, fundamental work to our democracy, increasingly it frustrated me to have a voice, but not a direct influence. I could be a critic, I could talk about the change that needed to happen, what others should be doing, um, but that wasn't enough for me. When my husband Adam and I had our wonderful three boys, and, and two of them are there today, the other's on school camp and can't be here, but Lockie, hello, if they're letting you watch. <laughs> When we had you guys, it changed me immeasurably. I felt things more deeply. My heart broke in a different way when I was with families suffering from grief. When I saw an injustice, I found it harder to stand by and not be an active participant in the change that I wanted to see. And I used to keep a quote on the fridge, I don't know if you remember it, boys, and I would refer to it um, when I talked to you about making friends, about standing up for what you believe in, and why you should intervene if you see a bully or someone who needs help. And it's a quote that is, many of you might be quite familiar with by Theodore Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out where the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. So here I am in the arena or the bare pit, bear pit trying not to be a sideline critic, trying to bring about change to elevate people and to support communities and families. That journey really began for me after journalism with a shift to the education sector. As CEO of an organisation called Life Education, better known as Healthy Harold. I was a volunteer, then a board director, and then in a sliding moment, a sliding doors moment for my career and really for my whole life, I took on the role as CEO, first at state level, based at Colleton in Sydney's West for four years, and then nationally. It was great work. We worked to improve the lives of young people by giving them the tools, the knowledge and the strategies to make better choices about their mental health and their physical health, whether it be nutrition, cyber safety, bullying, resilience, or vaping and other emerging issues in schools. Not fixing their issues, not giving them the solutions, not telling them no, but empowering to them to make those choices for themselves. And in many ways, they're truly liberal principles too. I felt I was making a positive difference to hundreds of thousands of lives and it was incredibly satisfying to work with teachers and parents in schools right across New South Wales, from my electorate in Vaucluse to Lakemba to Lismore and to Lightning Ridge. I gained broad insights into the issues that mattered to young people and a deep respect and admiration for the educators that I employed and also the incredibly hard-working teachers that we supported in schools across the country, particularly during COVID. Through that role, I made a lot of friends in this chamber um, and I saw the absolute best side of politics and politicians, people in this place who were shifting the dial for their communities. 
I saw their behind the scenes advocacy, the care, the commitment, the power of grassroots advocacy that you guys all do every day and is largely unseen. And I thought perhaps I too could, through politics and policy, make an even greater contribution. Just take a sip. My work in education connected me with young people and I loved that. And I want to continue to hear from young people in my new role as the member for Vaux Clues. I want to ensure that their input is part of the decision making here in Australia's oldest parliament. New South Wales has the most impressive generation, Australia does, of young people aged between 18 and 25. Statistically, they drink less, smoke less, take fewer drugs than generations before. They are a socially minded cohort of problem solvers, change makers and innovators. They are impressive. But they are growing up in a world that is complicated and busy with a torrent of information via the internet and social media that can be overwhelming a distortion of what real relationships look like, what real bodies look like, what success looks like, what community is. And this is one of our biggest modern social challenges, how to balance an era of information and misinformation, of exponential change, of artificial intelligence, of uncertainty, of division, of left and right rather than right and wrong, how do we balance that with the care and connection and stability that this young generation needs? They have never had so much information, so much online connection, um, but so much loneliness and fragility. Suicide is the leading cause of death in 15 to 24 year olds. Around 20% of young people report high or very high levels of emotional distress. Young men are most at risk. When we champion our young women, and we must, and I will in this place, we also need to champion and praise our boys. They need it. It is so important for us to listen more to our young people, ensuring that their voices are heard in our policy making, that they feel engaged in the political process. And that's why I invited student leaders from across the Vaucluse electorate to join us here in the chamber today. Could you guys stand up? <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, guys. You can sit down if you like now. But we've got from King Coppel, Charlotte Field, and Ariella Perkins, from Cranbrook School, Josh Smith, Ed Walker, and Owen McGee, from Kambala, Hayley Green, and Jessica Allen Waters, and from Rose Bay Secondary College, Isaac Hemsworth Smith, and Zach Villa. Guys, thank you for coming today. Let me know how to better represent you. My door is always open and I'm so grateful you took the time, you know, most of you during an HSC year to come here today. Young people in my community tell me that their, one of their greatest priorities is the environment and that is a shared priority with their parents and their grandparents too. It's a priority for me. So that's why um, it's with great pride that I've started my parliamentary career as the Shadow Minister for the Environment. What a privilege it is for me to immerse myself in policy making and decision making that will preserve our natural environment, our waterways, um, our lands, our forests for future generations, not just preserve but enhance. And that's a job that I relish. I can apply that to my backyard, continuing to protect the spectacular South Head, the marine life in Parsley Bay. The penguins that popped up in Point Piper last week, and that's a lot of peas. <laughs> and the great work being done by our local councils, Wallara and Waverley councils and their grassroots environmental initiatives. But back to young people, and I want to thank the most important young people in my life, Tom and Lockie and Will. Boys, you will be at the front of my mind in every decision that I make in this place. I am here to make a better future for you and for your generation. I thank you for your love and your support, for the laughs, for keeping it real, and for understanding the long hours that have gone into this and will continue to do so. I want to thank my husband, Adam Connolly. We are coming up to our 20th anniversary, wedding anniversary this year. Adam, <laughs> I love you so much. Um, I'm grateful that you're in my life. You are the best decision that I've made. <laughs> you're a great dad to our boys and thank you for making me laugh. I needed that quite a bit over the last six months. <laughs> to my mum and dad, who I wish could be here, but they can't today. Mum and dad, thank you for teaching me what matters. 
for being incredible role models, for teaching me the difference between right and wrong, that kindness matters, that humility is a trait to be admired, and that service to others is an obligation to be embraced, for giving us so much. To Spud and Sweet, my brother and sister, <laughs> sitting in the gallery, thank you for coming and thank you for keeping it real. To my grandmother, who is 97, she can't be here today. Pama, I promise, I promise, I mean it, politics won't change me. <laughs> <laughs> At least not for the worse. And to someone who knows me probably better than anyone, my best friend, Nina Stevens, who tried to talk me out of this when I first said I was considering politics, <laughs> but who nonetheless, like good girlfriends do, has supported me protectively through this crazy journey. Behind every woman who does something big is a tribe of other women supporting her, too many to name, but Annabelle Mers, Amanda Lawson, Rowena, Amelia, Vix, Mel, the school mums, to Anna Hayes, Anna, who's known me longest, and to Gabrielle, Gabrielle Upton, the former member for Vaucluse, who I think deserves an applause. <laughs> Gabrielle, thank you. Thank you for your friendship and your support. You are a class act and you've made my job so much easier. We both follow some trailblazers, like the former member for Vaucluse, Rosemary Foote, who was the first Australian woman to be endorsed by a major party to contest an acknowledged safe seat. She entered parliament in 1978, one of only two women in the Legislative Assembly, and for a while she was the only one. Back then, the bear pit was aggressively masculine, I read, back then. <laughs> But she held, she held her own and she is an inspiration. I raised her for a couple of reasons. She was a trailblazer, but also she was a critic of the ocean outfall sewage disposal system that affects the eastern suburbs beach as a situation which was a local public health issue. Um, I'm afraid to say that 45 years on, you wouldn't believe this, sewage still pours off our cliffs untreated directly into the ocean, an environment and health hazard. It is unique to our electorate and a legacy of our ageing infrastructure. But again, I pay tribute to Gabrielle Upton and the former coalition government for coming up with the funding and the action to put an end to that. I will ensure that that project is completed. Connection to my community comes through many channels, but I especially thank my Liberal Party conference, all 700 branch members plus. I'm so sorry I couldn't fit you all in. Thank you for the wonderful support you've given me, especially the branch presidents and the campaign committee led by Daryl Hughes. Thank you to our amazing conference president, Janice, Janet MacDonald, who's done so much for the Liberal Party and for our conference, um, and to the SEC executive. Thank you to my wonderful friend, Sally Betts. There are so many more people I would like to call out individually. I thank the hundreds of volunteers who gave their time to post core flutes in the electorate, who stood on polling booths, who put signs up in their backyards. I'm in awe of your commitment and your support, and I hope, I really truly hope, and I'll try my hardest to meet your expectations. <laughs> Lastly, Vaucluse, thank you. And how am I gonna help you? The issues will change over time, but my values won't. I believe in freedom of worship, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of choice. That's partly because so many people have emigrated to Vaucluse from different parts of the world who are fleeing systems that denied them the same freedoms we take for granted today. The most important job I can do for you is to remove barriers to your individual success. These are liberal values and they are my values. We've been accustomed in recent years in particular to government solving our problems. The pandemic did make that necessary for a short period of time, but we need to resist the heavy hand of government intervention in perpetuity. We need less bureaucracy, less regulation, fewer taxes and less interference in our daily lives. Enough of being told how to think, how to act, how to vote, how to parent, how to look and who to love. You should be able to dream big, get on with the job and make this state a better place. And the best thing I can do again is to help clear the way for you. Because a community is not a homogenous group. It is a collection of individuals fortified by the contribution of new ideas and by respect. And I believe that New South Wales is the best state in the best country in the world 
and I believe we have not yet reached our potential. Our best times are ahead of us. We can be smarter. We can improve our education system, and we must. We need to be more inclusive. We need to encourage more in, uh, innovation. And we need to better celebrate our arts and culture. Our CBD needs to be so much more dynamic. There is so much opportunity, and to be here and to be able to make this contribution to change is incredibly exciting for me, and I actually, I actually still can't believe it. To the young people in the gallery, if you have a goal, I would just say one thing, be patient, and more important than that, be persistent, because that's what it's about. To quote, and this is a late edition, the amazing Tina Turner, <laughs> an awesome woman who sadly passed away today, I believe that if you just stand up and go, life will open up for you, and something just keeps motivating you to keep going. So Vaucluse, I am motivated to keep going for you, uh, no matter the challenges, and I will not take this really important role for granted. I'll measure my achievements not by the years that I spend in the chamber and not by the outcomes. I am in this arena not to be a critic, although I will be sometimes to those on the other side. But priority, my priority and my main objective is to be first and foremost a contributor. I will strive to make this state and my electorate a better place for future generations. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.